taking my experience or my gift or whatever you want to call it is I don't take it for granted. I always keep a healthy respect for the fact that I could mess up someone's plate anytime. We all could. We're all human. This is Plate Mark. My name is Ann Schaefer and I am your host. I'm an independent curator specializing in prints and printmaking. You have found us at series three of Plate Mark in which we interview some of the wonderful people that occupy the print ecosystem. Today's treat for you is a conversation I had with Julia DeMario. She is a printer who lives out in Northern California and does a lot of things. She, for one, is the printer who hosts artists at the Jordan Schnitzer Printmaking Residency at the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology, which is in Oregon. She's been doing that for over 20 years. And in the summertime, she heads up to Washington State and spends time making prints with Jim Dine in his Walla Walla Washington studio. I was really excited to talk to her because when I was at the Baltimore Museum, I acquired a Jim Dine print called Raven on Lebanese Border. And since then, I think that was in 2008 or 9, somewhere in there, I've been waiting to have the opportunity to ask Julia how in the world they got the effects they did. So stay tuned for that. Okay, housekeeping. My positionality, I identify as a cis head white woman and I use the pronouns she, her. I record plate mark in Baltimore, Maryland, the land of the Piscataway Conoy people. Any images that Julia and I talk about will be available to you over on the show notes at platemarkpodcast.com. And if you're watching this as a video episode on YouTube, the images will come up as they appear in the conversation. Also over on platemarkpodcast.com are two things I want to draw your attention to. One is a little icon in which is a small microphone. You can click it and leave me a voicemail of 60 seconds. You can ask a question or leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. The other is a support and donate button, which you can click and receive two options. One is to become a sustaining member at $5 a month, and the other is for a self-determined one-time gift of your choosing. It would help me keep the lights on here at Plate Mark. I'd like to send a special shout out to those of you who have supported Plate Mark. It means the world to me, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And for the rest of you, head on over to platemarkpodcast.com and click that button. It's just me. <laughs> Okay, I think that's it. Buckle up, and here we go. Hey, Julia, it is great to see you. Thank you for coming on to Plate Mark. Well, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> of course. I always get people to start off by introducing themselves and telling us what you do and where you are and all that good stuff. Okay, my name is Julia DeMario, and at the moment, I'm at the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology, where I've been the printer for the Jordan Schnitzer Printmaking Residency for the past 20 years. Every year, three artists are invited here to Sitka. I travel up from my home in California and work with three artists for two-week sessions. Generally, they have no prior printmaking experience, although a lot have said, oh, I haven't done printmaking since undergrad. You're going to have to reteach me everything, which is fine. I just don't necessarily want to work with people who make their own prints or have had the opportunity to work in professional shops before. It's wait, 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 why? To... Is that not the because mission it, of the... It, yes, it's the mission of the program is to make available this new medium to painters, sculptors, people who wouldn't necessarily be invited to make prints in a private shop and don't have the time or the wherewithal to go and take a class. Uh, they're interested in printmaking, but they don't necessarily want to become printmakers, but they would like to explore the medium for their own work. And you know, in general, it's, it's worked beautifully, and many, many of them have said that it not only changes their studio practice, how they approach their, their work in their home studios or their professional studios, but it also uh, changes the way they, they think about process. Because as you know, printmaking is all about process. <laughs> and yeah, I would say with, that, with a few exceptions, everybody has just um, been bitten by the printmaking bug, literally. How, how could and you not, right? <laughs> right, how could you not? Does the center then become the publisher and are they selling yeah. the prints that are published? Yeah. Yes, indeed they are. In fact, there was a show in Portland just this past weekend. Every year there's a Sitka Invitational and over 100 artists are invited to 
participate in the show. It's a big fundraiser, the yearly fundraiser for Sitka. Mostly they, the, the artists donate 50% of the proceed if they sell their work to Sitka and they retain 50% of the proceeds. And then that is a way to support Sitka and the programming that goes on here all year round. And this year, Jordan Schnitzer was honored because it is the 20th anniversary. So uh, all uh, many of the prints from the program and the recent portfolio that I did in 2020 to commemorate the 20th anniversary, all those prints were on the wall and they had a lot of prints for sale and they did very well with them. And this spring, there was a show here at Sitka, a weekend show, and there will be one in a local gallery here in Lincoln City in November and December. So, you know, they're, they're trying to get exposure for the prints they have in their collection because over 20 years, uh, they've collected quite a few. The way the publishing works is I print editions of 10 from each plate that they complete. And that can be a, a f anywhere between four and eight prints, depending on how they work and whether it's a one plate print or an image that requires two plates. So it varies, but I do editions of 10. The artist retains the first five, one over 10 to five over 10, and Sitka retains six over 10 to 10 over 10. The artist also gets a stipend. They pay nothing to be here. They're lodged, they work with me, and I and I print their work. So it's, it's a great deal for both Sitka and the artist. So yes, Sitka is technically the publisher. The marketing of the prints is the, the, challenge, the most challenging part of the program. Uh, but Jordan Schnitzer has generously funded the program for these 20 years and he pledges to continue on for as long as I want to do it. And I am um, absolutely positive that Sika will find an, a way once I do retire to keep the printmaking alive here um, because that's a big passion of his. And since they have this beautiful Ray Trail press in the studio, it's great to have it used on a regular basis. The word retirement, is that on the <laughs> near far horizon? I don't think well, you're that much older you know, than I, me. <laughs> Well, I'm 62. Uh, I, I guess I shouldn't use the word retire because I will never retire from printmaking. I am also trying to focus on uh, my home printmaking studio. I've made my own prints there. I've additioned Sitka prints that I was unable to complete here. I've brought the plates home and been able to addition there, but I haven't invited an artist to come and work with me there yet. But that is my goal, to have artists come to me uh, the studio works very well. I'm still figuring out the the lodging <laughs> for the artist because <laughs> it's great here. We both have our own places to retreat to after the day. Mostly I don't socialize with the artists outside of the print shop. We need our time to digest what's happened in the studio and just, I don't know, that's, that's the that's the big piece that isn't quite figured out at home, but that is my goal. So if I, I say three years, partly because it's, it's getting a little bit harder to leave home for two months at a time. My sister has generously offered to house it for me. She lives in Brooklyn, but since my, it's a very quirky, <laughs> <laughs> renovated hay barn, which I think I sent you a few pictures of it. You did. Yeah. Uh, and I have many animals that need, <laughs> need caring for and a garden. And, you know, there are lots of things that sure. make it impossible for me to just walk away. So she's made it possible for me to both do my Sitka job and also go to Walla Walla to work with Jim Dine uh, every year, which I've been doing since 2008. Oh, right. Uh, so, yeah. So we have to get to that. Too. Yes, <laughs> There's so many yes, things. <laughs> yes. So uh, I won't retire from printmaking, but I, I may cut back significantly on how often I come here. In Sitka, are you, is it just you and whoever the artist is? Or yep. is there somebody there who's like, come with me, I'm going to buy you dinner? Uh, well, there is an executive director, Allison Dennis, and uh, there's a wonderful staff. And there are usually four other artists here for any length of time between two weeks and three months. You can come for a three month residency, like at McDowell or VCCA or one of those other artists uh, residencies. So there, there is a writer here, there's an ecologist, um, painters, there's a ceramic artist here right now. So there are studios and living spaces for up to five artists here. Oh, wow. 
and I have the studio, obviously, that has the press in it. <laughs> but we do encounter other artists here. Uh, generally, we're all left to our own devices unless we need something from the office staff. Gotcha. It's sort of run like that. That sounds pretty ideal. Do you, is there an easy uh, website in your brain where people can go to investigate uh, applying? Yes, the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology. And uh, there is an application uh, on the website for the Jordan Schnitzer Printmaking Residency and also just for the general residency. I'm about to pull it up and sign on for the writing one. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, it's 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 a wonderful place for writers. It's so quiet. You can hear the ocean. Uh, actually, I can hear it. You probably can't, but you can hear it from the Sitka Center. It's just a half a mile walk down the hill to the mouth of the Salmon River. It's located just on the edge of the Cascade Head Scenic Research Area, and the Nature Conservancy uh, owns the whole headland. So it's it's protected. It's gorgeous. It's one of the only temperate rainforests left in the country. So I'm surrounded by old growth Sitka spruce. I, I say a rainforest, it hasn't rained since I think June <laughs> or May. It's been a very, very dry uh, fall, which is unusual. It's the driest fall I've had in coming here for 20 years. You're not plagued with the forest fires that are plaguing well, Seattle? Yes, two years ago, two years ago, there was a huge fire only five miles away from here, not even five, um, three miles away in the town of Otis. Many homes were lost and you, you know, it still looks pretty ravaged. So it has been getting progressively drier here. And so the risk of forest fire is greater as with everywhere, certainly where I live, it's a huge worry because I live right. in the high desert and right. we were, we're in pretty severe drought there. Before we, we move on to, because I obviously want to ask you about Jim Dine and Walla Walla, but we also need to know about you. But before we do that, <laughs> even, can you tell people what the printmaking specialties are there? Like you're, I know you're an Intaglio person, but do you yeah. have other uh, techniques that you do in Sitka? I don't. I just do copper plate etching. That's what people are signing up when they come for the JSBR. I have plenty of experience printing uh, wood cuts, linoleum cuts, and that's it. Not litho or silk screen. In Walla Walla, I work with Ruth Lingen, who was my colleague at Pace Editions, and she was the relief expert. We worked with B Bill Lagatuda uh, from the Tamarind Institute, and he did the lithography because Jim likes to mix it all up. He likes to have, be able to say, okay, I want, you know, this part in litho, this part in wood cut, and do a big dry point or whatever. Most of his prints are many, many techniques. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, so let's explain for people what's going on here. So Jim Dine, who most people know, should know, is a multi, he does a lot of things, sculpture, yes. painting, everything, but has an incredible body of prints behind him. Yep. And at some point, I forget when, he moved to Walla Walla, Washington, which sounds like a beautiful place, and established basically a summer studio there where you go and live. Yes, and this was in 2007. He'd been going to Walla Walla for maybe 20 years before that because he made a lot of bronze sculpture at the Walla Walla Foundry. Oh, that's right, the Foundry. Foundry. Right, right, right. Yeah. The Foundry got him there, and so he's had a residence there for um, many years. And he decided when I, I left Pace, when my husband and I decided to move to the middle of nowhere in Northern California and renovate this barn, he had the idea to set up a print studio in his downtown Walla Walla studios. He has two buildings that he connected um, right down in downtown. And he wanted, he, he talked to me about setting up a print studio so that when he is in Walla Walla, he'd have the opportunity not only to work on his sculpture and his paintings, but also to make some prints. So that first summer I drove up there from Surprise Valley, where I live, and I uh, met with his contractor, and we talked about the space and how ideally I would like to see it laid out. And I also engaged Tom Conrad of Conrad Presses to make, custom make, uh, an electrified etching press, a, a very large one. Tom Conrad is also the fabricator of the American French Tool Press, if you're you know, it's my favorite press. It's the press I have, actually. Jim Dine's old press from his Vermont studio is now my studio in, in Surprise Valley. It's made a very circuitous route to me, but 
we had that press in New York for a long time, but the Pace Studio ended up not needing it anymore, so I got it. But Tom Conrad also makes his own very dependable industrial strength press, and that's exactly what we needed. And it has been our workhorse for the last 14 years. That's amazing. The, I think somebody should build a idea. Bing! <laughs> somebody should yeah. build a website that, you know, the presses don't die, right? They keep going. They, and, yes, they, they migrate. Right? And everybody, yes. yeah, and everybody knows the lineage of their presses, and somebody yeah. ought to draw the the diagram that says, "Hey, this one was Jim's, that was Pace's, that was you know X Y Aldo's, whoever's." It'd be fascinating. Well, it's like the, all these pre these presses have you know all the DNA of all the printers who ever toiled on them. Exactly. <laughs> printed, yes. Yeah, yes. exactly. I have colleagues from Pace who've now moved all over the country and have set up their own presses. Um, well, Bill, he doesn't have his own press necessarily. He did, but, um, uh, and Kyle Simon was another printer I knew at Pace and he now has a wonderful shop, Farrington Press down in Joshua Tree. And he bought a Ray Trail press that I'd heard about. So printers have kind of a, a telephone game of where the, where presses are for sale, who might want one. He drove, I think, to Montana or Wyoming to get this press. You know, it's like when you see when you see the press of your dreams, you're going to go find it, right? right, you're right. Go get it. <laughs> yeah. If I'm not mistaken, Jim Stroud has one of Peter Milton's presses. Well, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Peter Pettengill has Aldo Crumling's press. That's right. So. That's right. <laughs> and somebody has Haters Press. I don't know which right. who has it. <laughs> All right. So before. We'll probably have to swing back to Walla Walla, yeah. but what, okay. can you tell us a little bit about you and how you came to printmaking? As I mean, when did art seem like sure. the thing you needed to pay attention to? It sort of started in my grandfather's basement. My grandfather worked in a bank or insurance company. I don't know. He never liked to talk about it in New York City, uh, and my grandparents lived in Scarsdale. I think we we spoke about our we did, yeah, connection. yeah, our Westchester <laughs> connection. <laughs> My my mother shipped us off to Scarsdale every summer. My grandparents loved to have us. I grew up outside of Boston. And my grandfather had a little etching press in the basement. And his two passions, I only knew him as a retired grandfather, um, not as uh, somebody who commuted into Wall Street every day. So he he grew roses and peonies. He was Scottish. So And his his mother had moved to Scarsdale with all her peonies, uh, her peony uh, bulbs or tubers, or corms, whatever you call them. I have and no so idea. My grandfather's, <laughs> yes, my grandfather's garden was extraordinary. I remember it as just a place I wanted to be with him at all times. He always smelled like, you know, blood meal and sweat. <laughs> and, you know, he did. His garden shed, I can still bring up that smell, that memory. And I helped him in the garden a lot, and I also watched him at the press. He did very competent, but, you know, pretty typical seascapes from the American Yacht Club and <laughs> his feet on the terrace, and he did a lot of etchings and dry points of his roses. And I still have quite a few of them. And I remember being fascinated by that whole process. You know, he, he worked not on copper, he worked on zinc mostly. And um, I, I may ha I have one copper plate left from that time. But when he passed away, I was 13. And my grandmother, I hadn't voiced any desire to have her hold on to that press. I, I didn't know what would happen to it when you're 13. You're, you know, you're just doing what you do in the given moment. But she was so determined to move up to Boston that she just gave everything away to the Episcopal Church. So... The Episcopal Church had, well, that was her church, and she they had a huge yard sale or whatever, a state sale, and everything in their house, including four tiers of very valuable Irish linen. Oh, because no. Because it was too, too hard to iron. <laughs> oh. It all went to the Episcopal Church, much to my mother's dismay, and the press disappeared uh, in that way. But that's where I first became intrigued with printmaking. Didn't have any opportunity to take it in high school, but once I got to Smith College, I immediately uh, signed up for a printmaking class. And I took lithography my first, well, first year you're not allowed to take printmaking, but then sophomore year I took lithography and my junior year I went to Paris to study and I found a, a small etching studio 
who would take me on as an apprentice and I could get college credit for working there under the printers who were helping other people with their editions. And I also got to make my own work, which I had to do to, to sort of fulfill my requirements. Wait, hold on. <laughs> yes. So, you took lithography and it didn't turn you off. <laughs> uh, no, it didn't turn me off. It intimidated me because I felt as if, you know, one, one drop too much of nitric acid and you can ruin your plate or your, or your uh, stone. So I thought, you know, I loved the way it looked, but it didn't draw me in the way etching did immediately. I felt like etching was much more forgiving. You know, you've got this sturdy plate, you can remove something and add something. And probably the history of what you've left on the plate is just going to make your print better. Whereas it, that never felt true for me with lithography. I wasn't uh -huh. a confident enough artist, certainly in college. And so etching like oil paint rather than acrylic feels very forgiving, but also you can take your time. I love the process and I actually love beveling plates and polishing plates and, and just all the things that go into preparing a plate. I really enjoy. They're not just tedious chores to get a plate ready for an artist. I love every aspect of handling the plate. And I didn't feel that way about stones. And in fact, somebody in my sophomore class dropped a stone on her foot and, you know, had to have a toe amputated. You know, it was so, <laughs> yeah. And I think that's fairly common, people having accidents with large slitho stones. Oh, Maybe the gosh. safety practices are better now. In fact, I know they are because I've been back to that shop at Smith somewhat recently. And, you know, the safety practices are better than they were in the 80s. <laughs> you know, Robert Townsend, he also well, got his... Caught yeah, Bob his... is supposed. I have been in touch with Bob about doing one of these, and he he has put me off till the new year. So hopefully, shortly we'll get together. Well, his he sh his ear should have been ringing because his name came up with Jim. I just saw Jim dine in Portland on Monday, because Jordan Schnitzer, who has one of the largest collections of his prints anywhere, or maybe <laughs> the largest, just acquired a great number of works of Jim's, both finished and unfinished. He, wow. He's, yes. So I was there with Jim to help sort of give the background of some of the archival material, the behind the scenes templates and proofs and all the things that are very helpful, certainly in a didactic sense. And Jordan is really, really enthusiastic about sharing how prints are made. So the fact that he's acquired all this pre-edition work from Jim is very exciting. That is, and it's, there were some of Bob Townsend's prints in that collection. So we were talking about him. <laughs> oh, funny. Yeah. Oh, that's great. When you're a, a cataloger in a print collection in a museum, yeah. you know, you'd get a, a dime print in and you'd look it up in the catalog resume and it would say something mm -hmm. like, you know, direct review or heliographer. And you're like, yeah. what the hell is that? And then it would never dawn on somebody like me until I started knowing all of you guys that I could just call the shop and say, hey, what the heck is that? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's so weird. So... Yeah. After Smith, at, wait, you went to Paris. Is the, is the studio something that people would know a name of? I don't know if it still exists. It was called um, Atelier 62. 62. 63. No, Atelier 63. Yeah, 63. It was 63, 63. Rue de Daguerre. That was the wait. number of the street. It was Rue de Guerre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hader had a shop on Rue de Guerre, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. No, I think I mean, so. I, I, well, was it right on the same street? I feel like it wasn't, but I, I would have to re really go back in my memory bank for that. Well, the shop was in multiple places, and the 17 was from 17 Rue Campagne Premier. So, right, right. Yeah. That's, yeah. Well, uh, Joelle Serre, S-E-R-V-E, was the name of the printer, and she had been a student of haters. Ah. And she still had her own very small and completely um, chaotic print shop, which I adored going to. It was in it had, was in you know the the bottom floor of an apartment block with a big courtyard, and the print shop was off the courtyard. Oh, nice. And there were a number of uh, artists from all over the world making prints there, and an Irish man who was sort of the resident printer 
if somebody didn't want to print their own plate. He didn't collaborate and make plates with people, nor did she. She just, Joelle just worked on her own plates and allowed others. I think it was a way to keep the shop open to, you know, charge fees and whatnot and take on students. So I just was there making my own plates and helping Stephen. And in turn, for helping Stephen, he would help me if I had questions. And in that way, I just made a body of work as if I'd been in a class, uh, you know, an etching class at Smith. That's how I, I got my credits for that year. It sounds a little like Atelier 17 in style and feel. Yes. Was it, was, were you there before Hader died in 88? Uh, I was there. Yes, I was. And I did, I think I told you, I went to see the shop um, as well. I was there in 1980, 81, but I worked in Joelle's shop. Oh, that's that great. Time. All right. Yes. So after Smith, you ended up in New York at some point. Did you go somewhere else before you went to New York? Uh, yes. I. Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, I will say that seeing this guy, Stephen, the Irish guy, who was, that was his job. He was paid to do it. It kind of put the seed in my mind. Hmm. That would be a really great job. <laughs> you know, I didn't know that I would ever find my way into a job like that. But I remember thinking that was pretty wonderful. So when I got back to Smith, I did, you know, I finished my degree and uh, got, you know, just a BA in fine art, not, not you know, in studio art. And I uh, moved home, <laughs> lived with that grandmother who gave away <laughs> <laughs> my grandfather's uh, etching press and worked in a, in a gallery in Marblehead, Massachusetts, just kind of a touristy gallery, but they had some nice prints and they had some prints by, uh, by Will Barnett yeah. and some etchings. He did a lot of woodcuts, but there were a few etchings and, and, you know, the other artists that were, they were popular, Tom McKnight. I mean, as I said, it was a very commercial gallery, but the, the gallery owner gave me a lot of leeway. Uh, he was away a lot. So I felt like I could get to know a lot of the prints and I, and so I, I like Will Barnett's prints well enough. And he was coming to town because he lived in, he grew up in Beverly, Massachusetts. Oh, I didn't know that. And so Stuart Block, it was the Block Gallery. Stuart Block asked me to go pick Will Barnett up at the airport and take him to his house. And as a 23 year old, you know, I, and just a sort of a, an emerging artist, maybe not even, I didn't know if I'd become an artist ever. I went to the airport and picked him up and he was very grateful. I drove him right to his house in Beverly. And then I brought him later that day or the day after to the gallery to talk to Stuart. And he said, you know, if you young lady, if you ever think about moving to New York, you must look up Robert Blackburn. He was on the board of directors for the printmaking workshop. And he said, oh, that would be a wonderful place for you to learn more about printmaking and make your own prints. You must look up Robert. He was very formal. You must look up Robert Blackburn. So that May, I worked there the year after I graduated from Smith. In May, a, a, a friend from college asked me if I wanted to apply for a job in an advertising agency as an art buyer in McCann Erickson, uh, this big advertising firm in New York. And I was at that point pretty tired of getting fashion advice from my 90 year old grandmother <laughs> and thinking, you know, something has to happen here. <laughs> advertising didn't thrill me, but I thought it would be a way to get to New York. So I went and interviewed and got the job and I moved to Brooklyn and worked on, uh, you know, up on Lexington Avenue for a year and a half. But I think the first week I was there, I went down to the printmaking workshop. I took Will Barnett's advice, I thought, well, this is the only connection I have to anything in the print world in New York. So I think I also sent you a, p a picture of what Chelsea looked like in, the, in 1983. I moved there in, in May of 1983. And it was kind of scary going to Chelsea after work at night because everything closed down. There were some photo supply places, but they all closed down at five o'clock. There was one deli that actually still exists there, which, which is shocking, the Hollywood deli. Bob was very, very welcoming. And he said, absolutely, you can come, you can be the night monitor, you know, fill the solvent bottles and empty the trash and we'll see how that goes. And here's a shelf. You can have a shelf for your plates and your, you know, your paper, or whatever. I was thrilled. <laughs> so I worked there two nights a week from six until midnight, took the subway home to Brooklyn, 
you know, got up and that's things you can do when you're 23, got up in the morning, went to my advertising job. My title was art buyer, which meant I had to really rein in the art directors who would want to hire Irving Penn all the time to take the photographs of the women for L'Oreal or whatever, Coke bottles, famous photographers, and the account people who would say, no, no, they have to hire this person, it's cheaper. So I was basically running around between the art directors and the account people and having to funnel all the bills from the photographers and the retouchers and the illustrators. It was, it was a glorified... Um, I don't know. I guess I was a, a gatekeeper. Right. Peacekeeper. And I had no clout and they just did what they wanted to do anyway. The art directors did. So I found that it was a very unsatisfying job in many ways. So I couldn't wait for five o'clock to come so I could go down to the printmaking workshop. And after not too many months, Bob said, I think you're ready to start helping people with monoprints. So in the evenings, I worked with people, artists. I, I think I also included a picture of Ellsworth Osby, who was one of the first artists I made monoprints with. I would set up the inks, I'd run the press, I'd take care of the prints, put them on the rack, flatten them, dry them, and have them ready for them when they came back the next week or whatever to make more prints. After a few months of that, he said, I think you're ready to assist Marjorie Van Dyke or Bill Hall you know, in, in the collaborations. At that time, the printmaking workshop, it was always strapped financially, but there were still New York State grants, um, NEA grants. There were, there were ways to get money into the shop. It was a nonprofit, obviously, to invite artists. Sort of like what we do at Sitka. In a way, it reminds me of that. We invited artists in the guest artist program, it was called, uh, and we we were all assigned different artists and, you know, sometimes worked for months or years as, as Bill, I think mentioned, he worked with Christianakis well into his pace years. I worked with Sandy Gellis, who was one of my very first artists for many years after my print making workshop experience with her. And I, and I, I just absolutely fell in love with the job of collaborator and Yes, in the beginning, I was Bill's assistant or Marjorie's assistant. And after a while, I was given, I think, Sandy and Arden Scott were my two first artists I got to do solo. And I just kept going from there. I talk, I asked Bill some questions, excuse me, about Bob, because he's legendary, obviously. But yes. when you were there, so this is mid-80s, right? Yes, 83 yeah. to Was he still on the presses or was he sort of the figurehead management person? He was figurehead management. I never saw him. I, I saw him print maybe twice, but there was, there was an a in-studio litho printer named Agnes Murray, and she was very, very good. And she would work with artists who wanted to do lithography. She was a very fine lithographer. And Bob gave her a lot of advice, advice all the time. He was always giving us all a lot of advice. <laughs> He was, he was a presence at all times, but he was mostly just in the office trying to raise more money. Unfortunately, that, that seemed to be one of his big jobs. He had great help. Debbie Cullen, who started while I was at the printmaking workshop, has you know, stayed with Bob right up until the end and has been very involved in the Elizabeth Foundation. And I remember Debbie from those early 80 days. <laughs> she was wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. And Robin Holder. So he had a good support system in the office. Uh, but he he was rarely out there printing by the time. Right. He's such an enigma to me because it's so hard to find, you know, the works are scattered to the wind and there weren't that many yes. of them. So it's no, really hard to, yeah, yeah, it's kind of crazy. I have, I credit Bob for giving me the opportunity and seeing in me, you know, that the possibility that I could become a good printer. It was really the opportunities Bob gave me that have led me to where I am now. So we probably should tell people that you are Jim Dine's favorite printer of all time. Well, he, he told me so himself. A lot of, he's got, <laughs> yeah, he has a lot of printers he loves. So I, I, I'm, I'm very flattered to hear that he said that, but well, I know, I mean, he you know, he works with, he wants to work with. He, yes. He likes to work in shops all over the place, of yeah. course, but there's only you and Ruth who go to Walla Walla <laughs> every well, summer. No, well, uh, Bill Legatuda did for many years. All right. And, yes. And Kathy Keene is uh, the other part of this equation. She was also one of our 
um, dear colleagues at Pace, and she lives in Portland now, and she comes out to help me edition here. So she's still very much a part of my printmaking life here. And since she and her husband moved to Portland in 2014, she's been coming out, actually, she's been coming out uh, to Walla Walla since 2012. She came out to help me with a history of communism. Are you familiar with that? Oh, portfolio? yes. I Yes. You sent me some pictures of you working or him yes, working on it. Exactly. Signing the stacks and stacks of prints. Yes. So Kathy has been helping in Walla Walla as well. Since That's the thing that I that I love about the print shop. I mean, I'm not a printer. I'm not. I'm not really an artist, although I have kind of an artist brain, mm -hmm. sort of. But the team that's making something happen in a print shop, the editioning or whatever, and Ben, my co-host Ben Levy, and I talk about the the. It's like a pit stop on a racetrack, but also like a ballet. Yes, it is totally a ballet, yeah. Right? And and you form these sort of um, working relationships and patterns with people that is, that becomes effortless, like you and Kathy, mm -hmm. you know? And so that as soon as you needed help, you were, that's the first person you called. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And I will also say that even maybe less so at the, the Par in the Paris workshop because everybody was just doing their own thing and there was a big language barrier in, in many cases. And I was young and still a student, but in all the print shops, from the printmaking workshop um, through to Pace and, and now in Walla Walla, that community aspect of a print shop is so essential to me. I thrive in that environment. Four brains can solve a print problem faster and with greater effect than one brain. So even if it's an etching problem, we may bring in everybody to try to solve it because there are so many printmaking problems that are across the board. <laughs> you know, registration, paper dampening, you stretch, pa what paper you're using. So that group effort is what is for me, a lot of the magic of printmaking. I don't have that here at Sitka because I'm one-on-one -on -one with each artist who comes in. So that's a big challenge to me. And it, <laughs> I have called Bill while I'm walking my dog down to, I also travel with my dog at all times. While I'm walking Fergus down to the beach, I called him, oh, walking, you know, this print I was working on, you know, the sugar lift didn't work and he's going to have to do it all over the aquatent. So, so I, I still call upon my past colleagues to help me solve problems if I can't come up with it myself. Because the other thing that's kept me in this profession so long is, although it's the same materials, the same techniques, every combination, every artist's brain that comes into the studio makes something different happen with it. So it never, it never gets boring. And, and the first proof pulled off a plate is always a shock and a surprise. <laughs> You, usually, hopefully, always a good surprise. Right. <laughs> uh, nothing you can predict for sure after doing it this long, how an aquatin is going to look when it all comes together in that very first proof pulled off a plate. It's always exciting. Of course. After 35 years, you know, it's still exciting. Yeah. Do you remember the time when you felt like, I'm, I've got it, I'm the master printer? I'm no, here. I've arrived. I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> well, I love it because I'm, uh, no, I have, and I'm not being falsely humble. I take every etch, every time I put somebody else's plate in an acid bath, I never have that overconfidence that of course it will turn out well because I've been doing this for so long. I always treat it like it's one of the first plates I've ever put in the acid. I'd never take my experience for granted when I'm going forward in a, in a collaboration. And I don't know any printer who, who does. I mean, I don't know all printers and some may have way more confidence than I do, but I think it's my, maybe it's my lack of, t t I don't know, taking my my experience or my, my gift or whatever you want to call it at this, I don't take it for granted. I always keep a healthy respect for the fact that I could mess up someone's plate anytime. We all could, we're all human. 
and our artistic our director at Pace, Joe, Joe Wilfer. Did you know Joe Wilfer? Yes. I never met Joe. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. He was such an inspiration to all of us at Pace. He was a wonderful printer, an innovator. He never said no to an artist. It's always, we can try this. Of course, we'll try it. I try to keep that in mind too, even if I know eh, it's probably not going to work. I'm going to try it because maybe it will, and I don't want to damp the artist's enthusiasm. So Joe was like that. He was an inventor, and he instilled in me that kind of keep an open mind. Yes, you are the technician. So when it comes right down to it, I am a tech, just a technician in some respects, or that's a big part of the job. You have to see that, right? And um, Joe said, yeah, you keep that open, you keep an open mind, and you also have to keep in mind that the artist has to feel like you're on their side. You know, you're, you're there to, to help them realize their vision and that relationship that you develop with an artist almost immediately when they come into the shop is as important as what you do for them technically. I'm very, very attuned to the artist's personality when they come, even when I'm choosing them based on their letter here, and I'm jumping around a little bit, but their artist statement in their letter when they apply, the tone they take. Mm. And I will, um, I will know almost intuitively if they will work well with me in the studio. Because two weeks is a lot of time to be in a studio with somebody you've just met. And one person is kind of in a position of power because I know all the stuff. They know none of the stuff. So I'm there to impart the information, but also not to be the whack-a-mole, you know? <laughs> no, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, it's true. It's a delicate, as you say, it's a dance. Whether you're in that group setting of a communal shop or one-on-one -on -one with the artist, you, ha you have to make them feel like their vision is all you're going to think about while they're there and helping them. Right. But I, I ask people, the printers particularly, all the time, if there was ever an occasion or you felt comfortable with an artist and it would Jim would be completely out of this column of people that you felt you could... Uh, push in a certain direction to get their work to be more yes. layered or meaningful or conceptual or anything like that? Uh, yes, here certainly. That's, it's a very delicate balance, but right. yes. <laughs> because these artists have never made prints. So I do insert my opinion a lot more here and push them. I especially push them to reduce on a plate. Yeah. Everybody just wants to add. They want to mm -hmm. add more lines. They want to add more tone. It's like, no, the burnisher is your friend. In many, <laughs> in many instances, it will improve your plate. And it's part of what I'm teaching you. You know, you need to, you need to remove as much as you need to add. It's a push and pull. I, you have a beautiful piece of sculpture, right? right? Your copper plate. I have so many burnishers, ball burnishers of all sizes. I love burnishing in my own work. And I, and I want people to try it and not be intimidated by removing something they don't like. Well, and, uh, and also to think of the burnisher as just another tool and not like the, I'm going to fix a problem thing. Right. No, exactly. Exactly. It's not just to fix a problem. It's to add a surface to your plate that you can get in no other way. Leaving part of your plate uh, untouched by the acid is a different white or a different plate tone than a burnished white. It's a much softer, much more lively white. So yeah, it's it's I do I do try to to influence or encourage them to move in different directions here. But I will say, never at pace. <laughs> I mean, I worked with, no, I worked with amazing artists, Mary Heileman, April Gornick. They knew exactly pretty much what they wanted to do. April certainly knew what she wanted out of her plates, and she was very good at getting that result. And she was a joy to work with. I loved and respected her when I worked with her. And Mary is just like an icon. She's she's a, an amazing painter, and it was thrilling to have her in the shop. And she, she maybe needed a little more, like, okay, where do I put the stuff down? She wasn't as attuned to printmaking. She loved the way the prints looked, but she wasn't as invested as April, if that makes sense, or like Chuck. Chuck was very invested in the process, as was April. I think Mary was more invested in the marks she could make and, you know, how, how she could achieve her, her ideas. Right. When Bill Hall was on, we, he did a 
favorite one, most challenging, you oh, know, the, yeah. all, <laughs> which he said, which one do you want to hear? I'm like, all of them, please. <laughs> Uh, well, actually, I would say that some of the most challenging prints were by Stephen Antonakis at the printmaking workshop. Bill and I collaborated with an artist named Stephen Antonakis. He was primarily a neon sculptor, and he combined paint with neon. He was one of the guest artists, and, and he made some of the most complex, uh, abstract, and geometric, crazy textures. He combined relief and intaglio and cut out paper, cut out plates that had to be perfectly registered. Some of them are, are quite beautiful. In fact, I was just trying to catalog my database or my archive, which is just incredibly difficult and a <laughs> tedious job for somebody like me. But Wait, I was do, do you want to hire someone to come out and help you? Yes, I do. <laughs> I need somebody to help me. Uh, why are you up for that job? I, I cataloged prints for many years, oh, many years. <laughs> yes, I, at least I now kind of know what I have. But I was pouring over Stephen's prints, and I thought, boy, Bill and I really did an amazing job on these prints. They they were not easy, and we 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 got results. And he was he was very particular and very demanding, and a really good start for me. Um, you know, one, one of the many starts I had at the printmaking workshop, but he was a right, great right. person for me to, to um, learn with. As with. Bill and I collaborated very well together, both at the printmaking workshop and at Pace. We, we really worked well together on many, many projects. And as far as my favorite project, I would say also back to the printmaking workshop, Sandy Gellis. We made some beautiful, beautiful projects together. And I, if you're not familiar with her work, she's, she's conceptual and site-specific. She deals with the natural world in her work, but in a very conceptual and time-based way. She's kind of a time-based artist. And one of the first projects we worked on was a New York City rainfall, where we put a small brass plate. Copper was too beautiful for her, so we worked on brass. She liked what? brass. Yeah, we oh, worked on interesting. that. It's, it's quite the same way. And we coated plates. I aqua tinted them. We coated them with white ground. And she put a plate out on her windowsill every day for a year. We carded the rainfall throughout. And so depending on whether it was a cold rain or a warm rain, a heavy rain or a light rain, the white ground would dissolve in different ways. And then she'd bring the plates back to me every week. We met once a week for over a year. And then beyond, because once I was no longer working at the printmaking workshop, we continued to collaborate at pace on my off hours. And uh, it was this gorgeous project by the end of the year. I think there were 200 rainy days in New York or something. <laughs> wow. And every plate was so different depending on the kind of rain. And she was also very, very challenging in her ink mixing requirements. So the ink had some brass powder and some graphite. And so this metallic glow kind of rose to the surface of the prints as they dried. I was mesmerized by that project. And I loved that continuity and using printmaking to help chart the passage of time and the weather in New York. And to have this visual, you know, when she mounts them all on the wall, they're just absolutely gorgeous. And the plates are gorgeous. She made a, a piece out of the brass plates. And we also did a project where she sent plates all over the Northern Hemisphere to friends in various countries, a bigger plate, like a 12 by 12 or 16 by 16. They did the same thing. She packed them carefully. They had their white ground on them. And then all those people sent them back. And so that project was called Spring in the Northern Hemisphere. Oh, that's cool. And so that kind of work really excited me. And we became great friends. In fact, I just spoke to her. She's 20 years older than I am, and she's still incredibly active and doing beautiful work and She's remained a big inspiration and a dear friend. And I, I find that I've made a lot of really deep connections with the artists that I've had the pleasure and the privilege to collaborate with. Two, two things just occurred to me. One, that the recording of weather mm -hmm. and rain specifically, probably there are very few ways that one could do that except for in printmaking right? Mm -hmm. Could you do, I mean, you could have water dripping on a piece of paper, I guess, but like well, to really... Did that too. We, <laughs> we, did, we did another where she dampened and let paper mold for you know, a curator. That probably sounds very scary. 
Uh, so she let all this paper mold and we did a whole nother project and that was just the color. Those plates were recording wind. We developed this a whole system of hanging sharp objects off, off of trees in Greenport, Long Island, where another artist, Arden Scott, she's a sculptor and amazing artist as well, lives out in Greenport. And she was part of this artist, I guess, organization that hosted art in Greenport. And Sandy did an installation. I, I helped her with it because it involved etching plates where she hung all these sharp utensils, like etching needles and needles and razors out from a tree. And they dangled onto soft grounded and hard grounded etching plates. So over the course that the, of the, I think it was, I don't know, a month that that show was up, the wind made marks on the plates because of the dangling sharp objects. <laughs> and then I bit those plates and they were a record of wind and we printed those, you know, on, on the moldy paper. <laughs> I love an indexical print. I did a show of indexical <laughs> prints at the museum, actually, and those sound like they would have been perfect for my show. I wish I had known about them. Yes. Well, Sandy, <laughs> yeah. So I would say she was my, probably my favorite person to collaborate with, just because I never knew what she was going to come up with next and where I'd have to send an etching plate or, and actually I invited her out to Sitka in 2003 or four, I think she was one of my very first artists. She wanted to do something with the tides are very extreme coming in and out of the estuary. And at the time I was living in a little house on poles down by the <laughs> estuary. And she was just fascinated with that and wanted to try to record something with the tide coming in and out. So we did our white ground, everything. I thought I knew exactly where I'd left it, kind of not too far off the, co the edge of the river mouth. We put this large plate in the mud at low tide. And I thought, oh, the tide will just come in, go back out. I'll be able to go and find the plate. Are you kidding? I couldn't find it. Oh, wow. And she was, she was disappointed. There's just no way I couldn't find it. The mud, you know, too much mud and stuff had gone over it. So we did other things where we recorded bark on trees and stuff. It was, it was still a very wonderful collaboration, but we gave up on that title plate. The next year I came back and I was staying in the same house and I looked out the window one morning when it was low tide. I was having my breakfast. I looked out and I thought, what is that glint? So it was like whitish and it just looked odd. So I went out and there the plate had reemerged and I oh found God. it and etched it. I mean, it was crazy crazy wow. that I was able to find it. So, And so yes. then you produced an addition from it? We didn't produce an addition because it had become too corroded, really. I, I would have had to steel face it and she didn't really want me to do that. So I sent her the plate and she made a beautiful addition. She scanned it ah. on her scanner and then she drew on it. She drew depth chart. She drew a lot of information on it and she made oh, an cool. addition. Of that. Oh, that's cool but we, we weren't, I wasn't able to audition it, but it was just wonderful to get the plate back. That's incredible, really. <laughs> we did manage to do something very cool with it. Right. I think plate marking listeners probably have gathered by now that, that printers like you are able to retain at least one printer's proof from everything yeah. that you've made. But yeah. that means that you can go back and look at those very early projects that you did and really look at your entire career as the printer, yes. which is so wonderful. And so you're cataloging your collection of printer's proofs, yeah. then, then what happens? Well, yes, I did it over the past two winters, basically, because I have the time in the winter. I'm not gardening. I'm not traveling to print. And it was wonderful to look back on a lot of these projects. And seeing a print could bring me right back to that time in the studio, whether it was at the printmaking workshop or at Pace. Well, the idea is uh, I don't want to leave it for my very small and somewhat uninterested family. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't say that in a derogatory way, no, but who wants to be left with someone else's 600 right. pieces of paper with ink on them, you know? And, and you didn't have, you don't have kids, right? No, I have a stepdaughter, but yeah, she, okay. she moved to Sweden. It's wonderful. I have a grandson now and it's very exciting, but my sister is also an artist and she's the one who comes and stays at my place. And she's very well aware of this collection and the fact that something should happen with it before I die and it's someone else's problem. So that's been the impetus for me to at least get an idea of what I have. Right. So, uh, you know, I'm 
I would love for it to go somewhere in the way that Bill was able to place his collection. But over the years, I have sold a lot of prints to make this barn dream happen. <laughs> I like to say that a suite of Bob Mangold's prints <laughs> bought us our windows, 37 <laughs> windows. Right, right. And I did a, a print workshop with Marie Watt, who is also, oh. if I had to say I have a second favorite, it's Marie Watt. Here at Sitka, we first collaborated in 2002. She was the very first artist I had out here. The first year I had two artists, Carl Pilato and Marie Watt. And uh, we've been collaborating ever since, and we've remained really good friends as well. And in 2016, Dwight Pogue, who was then the head of the printmaking department at Smith, invited us to come and do a three-day workshop through their program. So we collaborated and did. we ended up with two editions, and Smith published those, and Marie got a certain number of copies. Yeah. When all is said and done and you have your, your home shop ready to go, are you, are you by invitation only? Or are you open to people soliciting, you know, sending things in or? Well, I don't know yet. I think in the beginning, I have four or five artists from my time here at Sitka who have already said, sign me up. And so I think I want to break the ice in the studio with people I know, you know, so I can work out any kinks and they will understand that they're sort of the guinea pigs in a way right, right. for me getting it really running smoothly. So I think I'm going to start by inviting people I've already worked with from here because they're close. They can drive. It's also, it's hard to get to, you know, either you have to fly to Reno and drive three and a half hours, or if you live here in the Northwest, <laughs> it's, it's doable, right? you know, it's doable in a day. So that's how I think I'll start out with right. a few of the artists that makes expressed sense. interest. Have you, have you named the press yet? Interestingly enough, I haven't. Because I have a huge garden, I thought of the idea of Common Ground Press, oh. but then I saw that a lot of coffee shops called Common Ground. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. I haven't come up with a good name yet. All right, listeners, if you got one, send them my way. Yes, really. <laughs> no, I want it to be of the place, but not corny. You know, there's a lot of sage, but I'm not going to name it like Sagebrush Press. You know, that sounds right. like I'm printing counterfeit money or something. <laughs> um, so I, I haven't come up with that name yet, okay. but I will. I mean, Common Ground makes complete sense with etching, of course, but yes, yes. it is definitely. I was thinking of a gallery at some point and I wanted to create sort of a salon atmosphere, you know, Gertrude Stein and talking about yeah, art and stuff and then skewed right over to <laughs> beauty shops. And I was like, ah. <laughs> There's just not enough words. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. If people want to get in touch, what's the best way to go about that? Um, oh, I mean, the... I can screen them all if you want. <laughs> no, I don't want anybody to get in touch with me yet. Okay. <laughs> I'm too nervous about that. I guess if you wanted to screen, just give them my email and I'd be willing to talk to people. Okay. And I don't know if you, do you feel like talking any more about Walla Walla before we? Oh, sure. Quit? Yes. Let's circle back to Walla Walla. Okay. The man, the gym. Yes. <laughs> Having just seen him. And as far, I mean, he's my, he's like family to me now. You know, we've been working so closely for so long and months and months can go by when we don't speak or don't see each other. But the minute we're back in the print studio together, it's like it was just yesterday. That's the kind of communication we have, and we've developed, obviously, since the early days at Pace, where he worked with all of us. We were all working together on his prints, Bill, Ruth, Kathy, Joe. Joe was the big, the big boss then, and he was in charge of what we did with Jim, but we all worked hard to make Jim happy and make beautiful prints with him. And I was, I guess it was in 2000, Jim invited me and Ruth to go to Israel with him. He had been invited by an art collector named Dove Gottesman, who was very involved in financing this print shop on a kibbutz in, in um, northern Israel. And they were organizing a big print extravaganza where they invited like 10 Israeli artists, five Israeli printers, and Jim was going to be, you know, the master there. I think originally the idea was that he would just be working with all these Israeli printers. He wanted me and Ruth to come with him. 
So we did, we went and we all worked in a big, big communal shop and the printers did kind of a round robin where they worked with all the artists, although mostly Ruth and I just worked with Jim because that's what he wanted. And we made some beautiful prints there and really bonded as a team to be in a place outside of the, the Pace studio together. I'd had one other experience, shorter experience with him in Walla Walla at Whitman College, where we did the book Project Collie in the Whitman College printmaking workshop. They had a book arts program that Kathy Keene was very instrumental in helping to develop with Keiko Hara, who was the, well, she was definitely the print professor, but she was also the head of the art department at that time. And every summer they did a book arts symposium and Jim was invited to come and do a book project. I made small etching plates with him and Ruth did letterpress poetry. He's a, you know, a really amazing poet as well. So going to Whitman and that was in 1998, that was my first experience of traveling with Jim and Ruth we saw we did it well. And so he, when he invited us to Israel, that kind of cemented our bond as a threesome printing well together. And when he asked me to come out to Walla Walla and set up a print studio in 2007, I was, I was thrilled. And I knew, I knew we could make it work. And because we had such a good working relationship and a mutual respect, I mean, obviously I respect him immensely for the artist he is, but he also really respects what I do and we get along well just conversationally and we're so comfortable with each other that 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 is a huge part of working well together with somebody sure and i you know he can be very demanding <laughs> work. but that that pushes us on you know it makes sure. us want to work so much harder for him I'm sure I told you this when we had a conversation whenever the, a couple of months ago it feels like now that yeah I somehow managed to get Jim to agree to come to Baltimore to talk yeah. on stage with me. And it was yeah. my first interview with a, you know, some, anybody in front of a big crowd. And mm -hmm. I was terri terrified, yeah. terrified. I knew I had to go up and meet him beforehand because otherwise it was just never going to work. And we met in New York and that's actually the day that I met Bill. He took me up over to Pace and, mm -hmm. you know, introduced me to mm -hmm. Yasu and Bill, I think yeah. was there. As soon as I met him and he started talking, I thought, oh, you're just like my dad. And I know that I can tease you and you can take it. And that's how our relationship <laughs> moved forward yeah. the whole yeah. talk for the interview. It went, it went great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank God. Because yeah. <laughs> he no, doesn't he suffer does. fools lightly. No, he doesn't suffer fools lightly. He has a great sense of humor and he's whip smart. What's not to love about that? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, he was very kind to me. Before we go anywhere else, mm -hmm. I have to go back to Israel with you because I okay. bought Raven on Lebanese Border for the Baltimore oh. Museum Collection. Right. And I used it in classes, particularly the printmaking classes, as this incredible example of mixed technique, of course, because mm -hmm. Backgrounds, mm -hmm. the woodcut and the soft ground. Yep. And I always tried to explain how the one that we got, the ink on the woodcut background had splooshed out really nicely and it was mm -hmm. very visible. And I always try to explain it to people. And I'm like, I think this is what she did. And ever since then, I'm like, when I get my hands on Julia, <laughs> I'm going to oh. ask her <laughs> about the splooshing background woodcut ink <laughs> on Raven on Lebanese Border. Well, uh, Ruth printed on that as well. She printed the woodcut. Jim often wants ink to be watered down. So it has like, not watered down, but diluted. So that and, it, yeah. it has a monoprinting effect sometimes. It's like it's creating a monoprint effect within an addition in a way. If the ink is really loosened up, you know, and sometimes it's something a printer sees as a, as a mistake, right? It's not something that it's necessarily wanted if you're the printer, but we've learned, we've all le learned with Jim, if, if he likes it, that's what, it, that's what goes, right? That's, you know, I've learned to accept every little misregistration or overprinting. He loves it. He loves to overprint, but he doesn't like them to re register exactly, right. you know, so it's, it, be, it makes the print much more lively and also a uh, unique if, if there's something slightly different about each one. You know, it's, and right now, in fact, the work we did this summer, we made six or seven large, large editions this summer. 
woodcut etching digital combined. He had some oh. beautiful digital prints printed at the studio. He works at in Germany, Gerhard Steidel. He does a lot of his book editions with Gerhard. And he also has massive presses where he can do these big, large scale digital images. And so we printed on 600 pound paper, these digital prints and printed etching and woodcut over them with the idea that Jim was going to monoprint on all of them. They would, they were going to be basically the background on the canvas for what he wanted to do. And that's, that's become uh, pretty common. We did a whole summer of heart monoprints where it was a lot of woodcut layers underneath, some dry point. So we got the prints to a point where he then was wanted to work into them. And a number of the prints from this past summer, so they were all botanical, or the majority of the editions we did this summer were botanical images, and they will all be part of his show at Christia Roberts Gallery in London. That's all, it's called The History of Gardening, and it's his botanical work over the years. As will those, that triptych, I, I sent you photographs of the mm -hmm. Spitbite litho dry point combination prints, that triptych. Oh, great. You know, at Wonderful. Christina Roberts as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Christina Roberts shows at the IFPDA print fair, which is as we're yes. recording this next week. So yes. I, I'm are always curious. Up? Yeah. Yes, I am going up. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. Are you kidding? I wouldn't miss it. Yes. I know. I'm, I haven't been since 2019. Yeah. That was, uh, that's the last time any of us were there. And it's yes. just been <laughs> so. Last time any of us were there. Exactly. Yeah. It's the most wonderful time of year. I sing that song on the train up to New York every every Wednesday of the print fair week. Like, it's the most wonderful time. <laughs> it is. Well, okay. Did we speak about this, but were you there for uh, the talk that Ruth and, and Jim and I did? I somehow missed it. And I oh. remember coming into the fair and seeing Jim talking to Jordan Schnitzer yeah. and then going, oh crap, I missed it. And so yeah, yeah I, I totally missed it. I was like, damn it. <laughs> But that's videotaped. I think that's available somewhere. Oh, yes, right? I, yeah, it is videotaped. I think yeah. you can see it on YouTube or on the okay. IFP. Yeah. I will I'll include a link in our show notes, and along with all the pictures you've sent me, which are wonderful. Thank you. Especially love that one of the door of the printmaking workshop yeah. down at Chelsea. I was like, oh, that looks sketchy. Wow. <laughs> well, another colleague from the printmaking workshop years, Lynn Rogan, she was one of the printers there as well. She, she left printmaking a lot. Uh, earlier than the rest of us. <laughs> We're the diehards. Right? Yeah, right. Uh, and, and so I wrote her from here and I said, Lynn, I don't, I don't have access to my, my old photographs, but do you have any photos of me or the, the shop or Bob or anything from that era? And she actually was able to find those. So it's thanks to her that I have that photo of the front door. <laughs> Oh, great. Oh, wonderful. I'll, get, I'll credit her. In the, yes. <laughs> that's in her awesome. Way. Thank you. And the picture of me with Ellsworth. And I, can, I, I just look like a baby in that you photograph. You do look young. <laughs> I can't even recognize myself. <laughs> 23. Yeah. Yeah. I was in New York after college in 86, 87, 88, before I went off to grad school. And, you know, Manhattan yeah. was not particularly safe in the mid 80s. No, it wasn't. And I went home on the two train every night at midnight. Right. Usually after having had a few beers at McManus, which was the printer's bar, we always went to McManus for a beer after printing. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I guess I just feel uh, such lucky. a scene. Oh my gosh. I, I actually loved New York in the eighties. Oh, I know. I had a great time. $3 and 50 cents an hour at Bob Blackburn's and still afford to have your own room in an apartment, you know, in, the, in Brooklyn, right. you could still afford to be there and doing a job you loved because I forgot to mention that once Bob started paying me $3 and 50 cents an hour, I quit my job at the advertising agency. Right. My oh, father golly. thought I was crazy. He couldn't believe that I was giving up that job with, you know, it had health insurance and, uh, but no, I just knew, I knew that that was my door. Literally that door at the printmaking workshop was my door to the life I, I wanted to have in New York. Wow. And beyond. Right. Yeah. And Aldo Chromalink, who we didn't really speak about. I know no, Bill did. Aldo. There were some photographs in that album I sent you of prints that were, the plates were made by Aldo, the Jennifer Bartlett's. I think the caption says mm -hmm. the Edward J's, the Jennifer Bartlett's, the uh, Red Grooms uh, were the prints that I worked on while Aldo was 
working in New York for those number of years that he would come to Pace and work with American artists. But one of the things that he said to me, and he was, he was a wonderful, wonderful, very gentle and kind man, but boy, was it scary watching him go through your stack of prints after an edition. <laughs> you could see him making piles and you weren't sure which you know, oh, no. which pile were the ones he was accepting and which were the rejects. Yeah, it was, I can remember once being out, I don't know, just absenting myself, going out into the fire, the stairwell and crying, just waiting <laughs> for Aldo to finish going through the prints. Oh God. But also I learned, I learned a tremendous amount from him. And one of the things he said to me that will always stick in my mind, he said, you know, the best printer I ever had in Paris was a sewing machine repairman. What? An out of work sewing machine repairman. Oh he my. Because if you're good with your hands and you're attentive, you, you're visually acute and you know to look for things on a plate and you're careful, which, you know, repairing a sewing machine, like repairing a grandfather clock or whatever skill it is, you can be retrained to do something else exacting and precise. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, note to self, you know, <laughs> I could be re <laughs> replaced by somebody who repairs sewing machines. <laughs> But it was a way of him like cutting us down a notch, you know, in, in a kind way. I didn't take it as it, at all insulting or intimidating. I just kept it in the back of my mind. You know, I happen to be all of these things, careful and attentive and observant, patient with artists and with the project. Patience is a huge element in being a collaborating printer. Anyway, I, I do credit him with certain <laughs> attitudes I still possess about my job and is maybe what keeps me certainly humble or, you know, just always ready to say I could do something better. Okay. I could up my game a little bit. Okay. Do you call yourself a master printer? No, I don't like that term at all. Me... I don't, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> I mean, I didn't get, I, I don't have a master's degree. I didn't go to the Tambrin master printer program. I don't, I just, I call myself a printer. I, I don't, I don't know how else to call it. Plus the word master is so problematic anyway. <laughs> and you're not going to call yourself mistress printer. No. You know? no. <laughs> so I, I don't use it. I just, I'm a printer. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. A printer with a fair amount of experience. How is that? <laughs> You know, always <laughs> cutting yourself down a little bit. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't think it that way. I feel okay. very proud of all the projects I've worked on. I don't feel that way at all. I don't cut myself down. I'm not. Okay. No, no, I'm I mean, proud of if you thinks you're one of the best printers on the planet, I think you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Eh, look at you. It also eh. depends, well, but listen, it also depends on what kind of prints you're after. Jim loves the way I wipe a print. He calls it warm. That's a word he uses often, right? It's warm. It can be subjective. It's not just, this is what's on the plate. This is how it's being wiped. My I can plate, do yeah. that, but that's my, not my like, right. happy place. <laughs> I don't like that term, but I like to just feel a plate and feel the way, you know, it should look, the, it will look the best. So right. that coincides with what Jim wants from a printer. So for him, I am the, I am one of the ideal printers for etching, but for another artist, I can name a few in New York. I, I was probably, you know, I was like quaking in my boots because <laughs> the amount of precision or, right. you know, clean, no plate tone, no, no, yeah. that, that's something that I can do, but it's, I'm less comfortable with it. But yeah. Peter Milson told us that um, when we did a show with him of his copper plates, by the way, which were stunning, that Bob Townsend was the only one he trusted to write, wipe his plates. Yeah. So that's, yeah. and you, because he, Bob could give him exactly what he, he wanted from his plate. Right. And sometimes you can't even verbalize that. It's almost an intuitive connection between the artist, the plate and the printer. <laughs> and also the Sitka website, if you want to, they're, there are pictures of all the artists I've worked with, some of the prints that we that we made here in the shop, and their websites. If you're at all interested in, in yes, that. I, I'll I'll include links in our show notes so people can okay. can find you easily. Perfect. Yeah, for Perfect. sure. Well, it's been great talking to you. I I love the idea of the printer 
intuitive relationship with the artist. Like, it's just such a happy, it just seems like the best place in the world to me. And I, and I, I mean, I love being a curator, but I really, I envy your, your position there. That sounds so cool. Well, it is, it is what has kept this job magical for me all these years. It truly, truly has. So all thank right. you. This of course. It was great talking to you. You too, Anne. Thank you for listening to this episode of Plate Mark. We'd love to know what you think about Plate Mark. Leave a voicemail on that little icon on the website over at platemarkpodcast.com. Just click it. You can say, hey, we love it. We hate it. Whatever. Okay, let's see. Thank you to Julia for being such an engaging conversationalist. And as usual, I thank you to Michael Diamond for the use of his original music. Okay, we will see you next time.